Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 34 of For Your Eyes O-Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Cherokee Sentai O-Ranger. Every week we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listener. My name is Matt J. With me as always is my co-host and brother Dave. Dave, how you doing today? Oh man, I'm hot. Very hot tonight, Matt. Uh, I'm actually, we're, we're recording this pretty late because the babies took forever to go to bed. Uh... And so this actually may be our latest recording time, and that's kind of good because uh, earlier in the day, it was just too hot to record. Uh, the room I record in is on the second floor, and I do not have an air conditioner in it, so this can get kind of rough if it's on a sort of a hot Sunday afternoon. So hopefully, now that, we, uh, that we've got going, that everything will be cool, or at least cooler, you know? Yeah, man, I get you. Uh, anyway, so today, Dave, we are watching, uh, speaking of cool things, we are watching episode 34 of Cherokee Sentai Arrow Ranger. It's called The Emperor's Final Challenge. Um, and as I had mentioned last week, I'm going to try to mention who wrote these things. Uh, this one, again, was written by the same guys last week, Hiroshi Soda. Uh, and again, uh, my Japanese is terrible, so I apologize if I said that wrong. Um, but, Dave, of course, before we get into discussing this episode... We've got to discuss some other things, because shining in the heavens, there are five stars. What is our first star of the week? Man, you know what? The the first star of the week, Matt, is Baby Watch. We interrupt your regular broadcast of the Super Sentai Brothers to bring you a breaking news update. Baby Watch. Now, I know, I, I think we've done one of these kind of recently, but the thing about Baby Watch that makes it such an evergreen star is that the babies continue to be babies. Now, I guess eventually this is going to become Toddler Watch, um, but while the babies keep doing baby, uh, we're going to keep watching. So, this week in Baby Watch, Matt, is that babies don't sleep ever, I guess. Um, maybe they do, like, in brief moments when you've turned your back on them, just to get up enough rest so that they, uh, don't ever fall asleep in the evenings when you want them to. They're taking, like, secret micro naps just to sort of build up energy to wear you out later. Uh, but that's, that's the fun thing, Matt, is that they are, they're, they're wonderful, mysterious children, um, and who knows what they can do. You know, they're learning new things all the time, learning new words, climbing new things that were previously unaccessible to them. So maybe also this strange superpower of micro napping uh, is a new thing that they've developed. So I will keep you updated on that um, to see if they ever do sleep. But if not, man, I guess uh, I guess we'll just sort of descend further and further into madness here on the show, Matt. What is our second star of the week? Uh, boy, I, I, I kind of feel bad about this because yours is very exhausting. My my star that we're getting to now is actually very nice. Uh, Dave, it was a pizza club. Oh, Matt, that's nice. I know you like that. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, and this one was actually sort of a doubly good one because in, now normally what we do is we all get together and we go to a pizza place, right? Um but this time, because it was the summertime, we sort of had some new options because typically speaking, we roll pretty deep with Pizza Club. There's like 10, 12 of us that show up at any given time. Oh, wow. Really? I, you know, I didn't realize there was that many of you. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of a rolling group, so it's not always the same 10 or 12, but that's sort of about the amount that we max out on. Um, but what that means is that there's a lot of places that we just can't go, Right. Because, like, they just don't have a table big enough, or, like, they don't have a bar, or you can't buy a glass of wine while you're there. So, that sort of scotches the whole experience. So, we, what we did this time is a lot of the places that we would like to go that don't meet our normal criteria, everybody went out to a different pizza place, got a pizza, and all brought it to one person's house. We had, like, an outdoor pizza party patio potluck thing you know it was very illiterative which was nice 
Uh, yeah, that does sound nice, man. Yeah, okay. Here's here's the better part of it. So this was like a, uh, 12 pizzas from 11 different pizza places. Um, there was some thick crust, some deep dish, some thin crust, all, all manner of pizzas. Uh, most of them I hadn't tried before. Uh, but the other nice thing is that this was like right down the street from me and also on my birthday eve. So what I did is I walked out of my apartment, stopped by the grocery store that's down the street, picked up a bottle of wine, wandered down to a little quick fire pizza place that's uh, down the block, picked up two pizzas, and then just walked another couple of blocks to this party. And I just enjoyed like a beautiful... Like, it was as though people had thrown me a great birthday party, but they just did not know it was my birthday until I showed up. Um, I mean, I did tell them that it was my birthday. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you got to tell them it's your birthday. Yeah, so I, I, I told them it was my birthday, and one of the guys, uh, the guy who was hosting, like, upon realizing it was my birthday, was like, oh, well, I do have many fine scotches, so it is now time to, like, get into the scotch portion of the evening. Uh, which sadly I did have to cut uh, a little shorter than I would have liked because I had to walk home uh, later. Um, and I needed to be able to do that in a straight line. Uh, but it was a great time. It was a perfect sort of lead into my birthday. Uh, well, Matt, speaking of leading into your birthday, what is our third star of the week? Yeah, well, you know, I'm in a third star of the week is my birthday, which is actually pretty low key this year. As you know, you spent part of it with me, uh, which is very lovely. Um, so I got home from this pizza thing. Uh, I took the next day off of work. I slept in. I went, uh, I took myself out for like a little bit of lunch. I went to go see the new Ant-Man and Wasp movie, which we haven't really talked about. Have you seen that one yet? Oh no, you know, I haven't seen it. That one sort of came out in the theaters during my three weeks on the road, which was not a good time for uh, movie going, as you may be able to anticipate. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the case. Uh, no, it's really fun. Like if you liked the first Ant-Man and the Wasp movie, or the first Ant-Man movie, the, the, she was in it. You know what I mean. If you liked the other one, you will also like this one. Um, anyway, so I went out to that, and then I went over to your place. And um, our grandmother is in town, so I hung out with like you and Beth and the twins and Grandma. And uh, Beth made a great dinner. Um, it was really lovely. It was like the perfect like chill birthday. You know, like wake up late, go see a movie, hang with family... Uh, and then I went home and, like, poured myself a drink and watched... I think I watched like, some stand-up comedy and then I went to bed. Uh, and you honestly, you cannot do much better than that. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, thank you for having me over for dinner. And now, Dave, what is our fourth star of the week? Well, Matt, our fourth star of the week is that, as you mentioned, our grandmother is staying with me right now. Um... And what that means is that we are watching a lot of very old TV shows because, you know, that is sort of what Grandma likes to do because those are the shows that she knows. Uh, oh, yeah, man. You know, I remember when she was staying with me a while ago, Dave, uh, she we did a lot of watching either the Mary Tyler Moore show or New Heart, uh, the, the first New Heart, the one where he's the psychiatrist, not the not the the, the innkeeper New Heart. Anyway, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, so speaking of the Mary Tyler Moore show, um, the other show she was in before was Dick Van Dyke, and that is what we are watching. Uh, and man, I've got to tell you that Dick Van Dyke is like, okay, you know that Dick Van Dyke is one of like the classic sitcoms. Like, I, it's sort of like one of the sitcoms from right when sitcoms got good. Like, there are sitcoms before that, obviously, like Father Knows Best and whatever was sort of contemporaneous with Father Knows Best. But, like, Dick Van Dyke and uh, I Love Lucy and you know, the stuff that was on Nick at Night when we were kids. And I know that now the things that are on Nick at Night are, like, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and, like, it, it is upsetting the degree to which uh, Nick at Night has aged um, with us throughout the years. Oh, man, dude, I know exactly what you're talking about because when we were kids, Nick at Night was... I Love Lucy, Dick Van Dyke, uh, like The F Troop, which uh, is, don't go look that one up. That's a weird one. Um, like the old George Reeves Superman movie or TV show. Um, yeah, and now it is way, the stuff in it is way too modern. Anyway, that is not the point. The point is that I'm watching the Dick Van Dyke show because it is just what is on my TV 24-7. Uh, and I am home from school still. Uh, school's not started back up yet. Um, and so I've just been spending a lot of time with Grandma watching a lot of Dick Van Dyke and being shocked by how young he looks in it. 
oh my gosh, you know, you're right. Because, like, in my head, even young Dick Van Dyke is, uh, like, young Mary Poppins Dick Van Dyke. And the TV show is even older than that. I mean, I, I, I think it is. It's in black and white in the movie's color. But, you know, that's just maybe the difference between TV and color of the era. Anyway, all of this is to say, uh, Dick Van Dyke is great. Go check it out. It's probably on, I, I think we're watching it on Hulu, but you can probably watch it on YouTube as well. It seems like something that is sufficiently old that it's just sort of probably lying around somewhere waiting for you to watch it. Uh, anyway, Matt, what is our fifth star of the week? Okay, Dave, our fifth star of the week is that I went to a new shop today, a new shop and you said it, you, you went to a new shop date. You just went shopping and that's the star. Hey, listen, okay. I went shopping and that's the star. But sometimes, Dave, sometimes it's Sunday and we only have four things and I need to say a fifth thing. Okay, okay, that's fair. So you went you went to a store. How how was your shopping trip? Okay, well, it wasn't it wasn't just a shopping trip, Dave. I went to this new place uh, that is called a curiosities shop. And have, have you ever been to something that claims to be a quote-unquote curiosities shop? Um, no, I don't think I have. I mean, you know, I've been to, like, thrift stores and, you know, like, other, like, specialty things, but nothing that's just labeled curiosities. Okay, so here's what you get when you go to a curiosities shop, Dave. Um, it's curiosity shops answer the question, what if taxidermy was, like, Instagram spooky? Right? Oh, okay. Okay, so, like, what exactly are you talking about? Well, okay. Imagine going to a place and, like, you, okay, so when you walk in, there's just, like, a guillotine, and sitting next to the guillotine are two, like, taxidermied baboons? I think they were baboons. No, maybe not. No. Yeah, I think they were baboons. Okay, wait. Now, are these real baboons? I mean, they're taxidermied. They're not alive baboons. Uh, that would be very curious indeed. Um, no, but this place, it's, it's just full of, like, bat skeletons and, like, you know, this sort like, small, most of the skeleton stuff in there is small enough scale that, like, you know, they are cleaned and bleached and arranged and, like, articulated in such a way that they are display worthy. There's also weird stuff just like a giraffe's skull. Um, and man, I don't know where, like... I have a very... I don't have a huge apartment. Um, and I'm just trying to imagine how big your house has to be that where that you could, like, tastefully display a giraffe skull. Because, man, like, even disattached from the rest of the giraffe, that is small. It is, in fact, quite big. Um, it also has a couple of other things in this store that are sort of generally spooky. Like, I feel like this thing is very much in the middle of the den Venn diagram between, like, nerd and goth. It's, like, the sort of person... The sort of person who, like, really wants to go to a place called an apothecary. Um, or the sort of person who, if they don't have one, has at least seriously contemplated getting a tattoo of, like, a plague, like, a, like an old-style, like, plague doctor with the bird nose mask. Like, somebody like that, this is their bread and butter. Um, you know, black t-shirts with white print on it with, like, a, like, a, something, something spooky, maybe, on it. Uh, anyway, you get the picture. They did have a baby coffin for sale. Well, okay. No, 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 no. No, 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 stop. Think about this. There's, you know, like, the for sale baby shoes never worn. Like, that's very sad. But for sale baby coffin never used. Now that, that is a great story. Uh, because that means that the baby was fine, right? Maybe that baby's still fine. Um, and that's, these are the sorts of uh, brief bits of wonder, I guess, that you get at a curiosity shop. You can also buy like old medical stuff. But, like, I don't know what any of that old medical stuff actually is. And so I'd be very embarrassed to buy some of it and then find out that it's, like, you know, like, not, like, a cool, fun medical thing, but, like, a, like a weird thing you'd use on a butt. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> anyway, um, that's, that is my last star of the week. Um, it is a, a curious place indeed. Um, and speaking, Dave, of curious things. Oh, nice. Nice uh, transition. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking of curious things, uh, we are going to go watch this episode. Episode 34, as I said, The Emperor's Final Challenge. And I'm very curious. 
how it's, uh, uh, how it's going to end. Um, yeah, so again, uh, that was written by Hirohisa Soda. Oh, and this is something I keep trying to remember to say, but I never do. If you want to watch this with us and you haven't somehow have somehow not figured out how to do that yet, uh, you can... They're on DVDs, but you can just go to shoutfactory.tv and search for O-Ranger. And, like, the whole series is just up there for you to stream for free. So if you had been putting off watching it, uh, don't do that. It's a fun show, usually. Usually. This week, I think it's a good one. Anyway, we are going to take a break, and we will be right back. Okay, uh, welcome back. So we have just finished watching episode 34 of Cherokee Sentai O-Ranger, and... Man, okay, this show is so wildly inconsistent sometimes, but when it is on, it is very on, and Dave, this week, it is on. Uh, yeah, man, yeah, it really is. Um, okay, do we just want to get into it? Yeah, 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 so, okay, we start off this episode in space, um, there is a giant meteor, uh, they call it a meteor. They call it a giant meteorite, but I think that just means that it's a meteor. Um, I think meteorite is just like, like a small, a small meteor. If this is a big one, man. I don't know. I don't know what. Then is there like another word for large meteor, or is that just like a bad situation? <laughs> uh, I guess we just hope that that one doesn't arrive. Yeah, man. I guess at some point it's an asteroid, but I think that it has to be in the belt. You know, the asteroid belt. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, know, I know the one. The very one. The one that helps the, the inner planets keep its pants up. Yeah, yes, Matt. Sh sure. Okay. It helps keep the... Where were we? Okay, okay. So, we are in uh, space, as I aforementioned, a giant meteorite heading to Earth. Um, the O-Rangers are in the uh, their base... And they are watching the meteorite come down. And Chief says to Momo, "Hey, Momo, um, where, like, where, where is this going? Uh, please calculate the impact." Momo then turns to a screen that is just covered in four-digit numbers in like a random order. Uh, and eventually, these four-digit numbers resolve to a map, and we realize that the meteor is heading straight towards. Uh, the source of their conflict last episode when they had been fighting Bacchus Wrath. Yeah, uh, if you guys remember, Bacchus Wrath had, uh, in the last episode, set up some sort of, like, magma shower that was going to create, like, a super shield for his, all, like, his robots that had been defeated in the past. And then he threw all those robots at the O-Rangers, the O-Rangers defeated them, and uh, Bacchus Wrath got buried in his own volcano base, which is not necessarily what you want to have to happen with your uh, volcano base. Uh, it seems like sort of a bad, bad way for that to break. Uh, yeah, man, that's... Okay, so Bacchus Wrath is now buried in a volcano. Um, and we, we cut down into that volcano, and... It seems like Empress Hysteria and the terrible Prince Bulldont are free from the rubble and they're just wandering around. But Bacchus Wrath has been like full on, like collapsed in on the 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 rubble, right? So the meteor hits. Um, now a couple of things to say about this. When the meteor hits, there is just like a family who is camping there. Yeah. Okay. This is something I wanted to talk to you about. Um. There is a family camping on the side of this volcano, but this is like the same volcano that yesterday Bacchus Wrath had been sending giant robots out of. And also it is a volcano, and it's probably not an active volcano, but we know from earlier in the series when Barra Magma was out that sometimes the, the Baranoia robots can turn an inactive volcano into an active volcano. Yeah, Dave. And also, I don't know if you remember, last week, one of the robots we saw was Baramagma. Um, I don't know if it was one of the ones that grew giant or just one of the ones that was down in the, uh, the the basement of the volcano. I guess volcanoes don't have basements, but you know what I mean. Down in there. Um, anyway, bad camping spot is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, dude. So, this family is there. The meteor hits, and... Although this is a giant meteor, and you would think that it would cause, like, some sort of, like, catastrophe when it hits, really, it's kind of fine. 
And it's fine for reasons we'll get to in a minute that are kind of hard to follow. Um, but what happens is... Okay. No, no, no. Hold on. Let, let me look at my notes. Do, do, do you have this written down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... There's a sword. The meteor is a sword, is what happened. Do you know how sometimes, like, a like the metal from a meteor when it lands will get turned into a sword? I know uh, Terry Pratchett had one of these made. Oh, was that so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he had, like, collected a bunch of, like, s- a star metal from, like, all over the countryside from various, like, meteorite impact sites and had it turned into a sword. Hey, man, uh, I, I guess if you're going to have a cool sword made that's that's the maybe the best way to do it yeah okay so this thing lands and instead of having then to get turned into a sword it just already is a sword and i don't know if the meteor was a sword to begin with or if it just like got forged into a sword when it impacted the earth uh because parts of the metal do break off right um because one of the one of the kids who was camping is gonna find this chunk of metal um, it's going to be kind of relevant, but not in the way that you may expect. Yeah, it goes... Th- this episode goes places. So, the sword lands. It lands inside the volcano down in its basement. Um, and it breaks through the rubble. And Bacchus Wrath rises up. But now Bacchus Wrath is a giant? And what's weird is it's not actually the original... It's at least a modified version of the original Bacchus Wrath like suit. Like the the weird stuff that's on the back is all different. It's not like the same cogs as before. Now it's a little more like I don't know, man. It's a little more Final Fantasy looking. I guess it's the only way I can describe it. Yeah, that's probably fair. So like a little, he's a little more Final Fantasy eight than he used to be. Yeah, man, eight. That was definitely some eight going on. Okay, um, we are kind of getting off the track here. So he rises up. Empress Hysteria and Prince Bulldont um, are thrilled to see that he is still alive. And not really surprised that he's giant, but, you know, uh, I guess a little bit. Uh, they, the, you know, there hasn't been... Acha and Kocha were not involved, I guess is the uh, the thing to get at here. Um, so now, this is his, he calls it his Dark Sword. And it made me think that he had summoned this Dark Sword from space and that he had owned it the whole time. But apparently, the sword makes him invincible, and now he's going to go destroy everything. Because it's now, like, it's made out of some, like, space metal. Does he mention the space metal yet? I don't know. He might mention it a little later. In any case, it's like a super indestructible space metal. It's like... It's like, what if one of Wolverine's claws was the size of a building? That's the space metal. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to describe this. So, he bursts out of the ground with this giant sword... Um, and why he is only summoned to this giant sword now, if he had the option before, who knows? Um, but he bursts out of the ground. They see it on the display screens up in the headquarters. And Yuji is like, oh, cool. Um, well, there's Emperor Bacchus Wrath. It is time to go destroy Emperor Bacchus Wrath. Uh, and luckily, we just got these great new robots, so let's go. Um, he starts to run off. No one goes with him. Yeah, man. Like, Goro turns to him and is like, um, Yuji, you need to chill for, like, literally one second. Can you do that for me? Because the chief told us to hang out. Uh, yeah. The, the, the thing about that, Dave, is that Yuji cannot chill. Even for one, one, the briefest of moments. <laughs> Yuji just runs off. He's like, hey, man. Uh, the, the, my blue blocker is invincible, so I am just gonna go take care of this new problem all on my lonesome. Um, so he does, he summons blue blocker. Uh, apparently now all of these things get shot out of that same cannon that, uh, Red Puncher gets shot out of. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. You wouldn't want to just build one giant cannon and the only thing that that cannon does is shoot one robot. Especially when you have new five, five new robots that are the same size. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. So, okay. Yuji lands, and this was a terrible idea, because, you like, even though the blue blocker is tough, and, like, it was tougher than... Uh, what did he beat last episode? Um, I'm not sure. I think it was Barra Saucer? I think it was Barra Saucer. Okay, let's let's just say it was Barra Saucer. So, he beat Barra Saucer last episode, but he is not beating uh, Emperor Bacchus Wrath this episode. Because this space metal alloy sword 
just like cuts like it cuts through the weapons on the blue blocker because blue blocker has these giant bladed tonfa batons that are the same as Yuji's like person sized tonfa batons. Um, they don't have a blade really; they just have like these sort of blocky angles. But I guess getting hit with them would still be very bad. Yeah, I mean it's still a tonfa baton the size of like a jumbo jet, so that's. That's probably a bad day when most things get hit with it, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably fair to say. So, he he tries to do this fight. Oh, and these kids who were camping, this family who was camping, they're just standing there kind of watching this all happen. Um, <laughs> Bacchus Red gloats about how his space metal is invincible. And then the kid looks into the crater and he sees a glint. Yeah, man. Okay, so he sees like a chunk of this space metal down in there and he thinks, okay, um, Emperor Bacchus Wrath has this space metal. The, I'm sure that if the O-Rangers can get their hands on this piece of metal, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in my notes, I just want to say, in my notes, this thing is described as a glowing piece of that radical rock, uh, which is a very good guts joke. It's okay. That's, that's all. I just wanted to interject. Oh, okay. Uh, so, take it away, Mo. I'm Dave. You're, you're not Mo. You know what I mean. It was, that's another very good guts joke. It's, man, it's, it's a guts joke. It's not a, okay. So, <laughs> uh, Kid runs in and grabs this thing, um, which is a terrible idea. Children should not be running into uh, war zones in any case. Um, but, so Yuji has to escape, right? He's got to get out of here, or otherwise he's going to get destroyed. Um, he gets back to base, and to everyone's credit, uh, their response to him returning is, Hey man, I'm glad that you're back and alive, because I feel like my response would have been, Hey Yuji, you know how we said, please don't go off on your own because you're definitely going to get defeated? Uh, and then you said, that can never happen, I'm invincible? Well, now we have problems. <laughs> so as they're all sort of consoling Yuji for his sort of embarrassing failure, uh, the chief rolls in and says, yeah, so... Oh, because Yuji had said, like, I wish you all would have come with me because if we were all together, we would have won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if... So, okay. He thinks that all of them together had a chance... And the chief says, no, you can't all do it just by, like, rolling in with the five blockers. The only thing that's going to defeat him is if you all combine your blockers into, like, O Blocker, which is, like, the new giant version of this robot, um, which we will see. I guess we sort of saw it in the credits. Yeah, they, they did that thing. You know the thing they always do where they show you the cool thing from the episode in the beginning before the episode to get you to watch the episode so you can see that thing again in the episode? Yeah, they do that thing. Okay, so we, we know that this thing is going to look rad. Uh, it looks extraordinarily boss. Um, we will get to it in a bit. But Chief says, listen, you've got to get together into O-Blocker. And then you need to use O-Blocker's like, final weapon, like its cool sword attack. And that will defeat him. And Yuji's like, yeah, man, okay. So we all should have gone out together so we could have formed this thing and used the ultimate weapon. Easy peasy. Let's get back out there. Chief says no, because they, they're they not currently in the right state of mind to do it. And this is when this show reminds you that it's kind of a technology show, but also definitely kind of like a weird magic show. Yeah, man. Okay, because the next thing that they do is that the chief tells them that they need to combine their hearts to reach a transcendent state of mind. Right? Of course they do. They need the power of five, man. Yes, this is exactly the power of five. It is back. I am so happy. So they go from the base to a waterfall. They have all now dressed in like... I don't know what the right words for it are. I am... This, like... Cool samurai robes, maybe? They're all white. They're very flowy. You know, they're belted at the waist. They're not, like... Like, karate geese. They are, like... Like, if all of Usagi Ojimbo's laundry got bleached, it would kind of look like this. And they've all got katanas... And Chief says, 
okay, here's what I need you to do. Get these, take these katanas. Oh, and they're all also standing in front of, like, iron samurai helmets. He says, take your swords, split these helmets in half, right down the middle. To which all of them say, like, A, this is weird, because, like, these are just swords. We need to fight a giant robot. And Chief says, no, man. When you can get your mind in the right transcendent state that will allow you to split these helmets in half, when you truly believe in yourself and your allies, then you will be able to split the helmets, and then I'll know that you are capable of, like, controlling the power of the sword of the combined O-blocker. Uh, they all try, and of course it goes terribly. I mean, okay, it, it, it has to go terribly at this point in the episode, right? Yeah, I guess that's fair. I mean, if they could do it already, then this episode would be, like, half as long. So, they... Okay, what, what, why don't you take this? Okay, Matt. So, they... Yuji hits the helmet. The sword bounces out of his hand. And it lands, like, blade down in the water next to the waterfall. Chief goes over pulls it out of the waterfall and, like, holds it high in the air with the sunlight gleaming on it, talking about how he needs to hit this transcendental state. And then, instead of them all trying again, Garo gets a call on his, uh, his power bracer, um, and the kid, whose name, the kid who had gotten the piece of the Sky Metal earlier, um, his name is Mikio, and I don't know how he is managing to do this, but he has definitely just, like, tuned into their, like, communicators using his walkie-talkie? Is, uh, is Mikio a kid that we have seen in an earlier episode? Man, I don't know. I feel like I, I don't always remember to write down the kids' names when they appear in this show. And I really should, because I should, like, be able to go back and cross-reference whether or not this was one of the many children we have seen earlier in this show who have helped the O-Rangers. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this is the kid that used to be a robot. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so Mikio says, I've got this glowing piece of this radical rock. Um, it's not actually glowing, it, but it is a chunk of that radical rock. Um, and he says, I'll bring it to you. The O-Rangers say that's a terrible idea because if the Baranoia Empire sees you taking stuff from the crash site, they're defo going to try to murder you. Uh, which is not what you want, and it's not what we want, because we are responsible adults, and you should be a responsible young child, to which the kid says, man, I'm not afraid of the paranoia. The paranoia are a bunch of chumps. I'm just going to get this rock and walk it over to you. I'll meet you at such and such a bridge at such and such a time. Mikio out. <laughs> so he hangs up on them, and then the O-Rangers are all like, well... I guess we have to stop with our iron helmet splitting practice and go save this child from almost certain death. <laughs> so they all run off, um, leaving the, the, the chief just sort of like standing probably ankle deep in this river, like wondering when they are going to get around to finishing their training. Um, and they all like they transform and they hop on their bikes and they drive to where Mikio is. Um, they're not in their robots. Which is only important to note because Bulldont is there and he says, well, hey, if you guys aren't in your robots, then I can take you. I don't need to call my dad. I'm a grown boy. I can kill these Power Rangers by myself. And then instead of actually doing that, yeah, he doesn't actually do anything. He just summons a bunch of Barra soldiers and says, you kill him, which I guess is delegation. You know, he's, he's learning the ropes of his royal duties, uh, which is going to be important later. Okay, we, we will get to that later. Uh, that is the end of this episode, and that gets wild. So there's a bunch of Barra soldiers trying to murder Mikio. Um, the O-Rangers are fighting them, and Goro says to Yuji, Hey man, like, we will handle this. Uh, Mikio has run off in that direction. You go find him and help him, because surely there are some Barra soldiers who are, like, about to find him. Which is true. Um, Mikio has run into the woods. He is, like, hiding under a tree. It's, man, I don't know if I've made this reference before in this show. I feel like I have. You know how in the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring, just as they're leaving the Shire, um, oh, like when all the hobbits are hiding, like, down in the tree roots next to the path and the Nazgul just sort of, like, ride by. 
yeah, 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 that moment. It's kind of that moment. The Burrow soldiers are just sort of like wandering around and he's like clinging to the wall underneath. Um, but he does, he does at least for a time manage to evade them. Um, and then he just kind of runs out into the open on this bridge. Yuji sees them, uh, him rather, and they're both running towards each other from opposite sides of the bridge because this kid is like totally convinced that the O-Rangers need this rock and that he is the only one that can help them. And if he doesn't get this rock to the O-Rangers, then the world is doomed. So he is like totally throwing caution to the wind. And it's very upsetting because this kid has a couple of like bloody spots on like he's got some blood on his cheek and like his clothes are torn and like his knees a little bloody and like he's not seriously injured but you never actually see kids get like like when kids get harmed in sentai shows it's never bloody right man if a kid like they'll get turned into a tree or something and then then the rangers have to stop that tree from getting bulldozed there's never just robots shooting them with real guns until they bleed I mean, okay, this kid did not get shot until he bled. Like, he sort of, like, tripped over some rocks and scuffed his knee and scraped his face. But still, it is... I had I had a more visceral reaction to this than I thought I was going to. Um, yeah, it's very strange. So, they're running towards each other. Yuji kind of gets to Mikio. He is blocking most of the attacks that are being shot towards the both of them. But in the sort of scuffle... Mikio loses his grip on the uh, the chunk of space metal, and it falls off the bridge, like, into the river. And this bridge is a ways above the river. It's, like, 30 feet above the river. They have no idea where this thing landed. It's just down there somewhere. I guess if they had, like, metal detectors, they could find it, maybe? But they do not have time for metal detectors. They only have time for robot murder. Um, and so the other four O-Rangers show up. They do murder those robots, uh, and Mikio is heartbroken because, as I said before, yeah, man, like, Mikio really thinks that now, like, because he failed in his, like, self-imposed rock mission, um, the world is doomed. And it's very weird because in any other episode of Sentai, this would have been important. You know, like, the kid would have found the rock, they would have brought it back to the base, they would have analyzed it, they would have said, like, ah... Uh, now I know we need to, you know, zap it with Cherokee energy from this particular angle, and then we can defeat this metal and the world will be saved. Turns out, in this episode, none of that happens. This rock stuff is a total red herring, and the only benefit it has, and actually, it okay, yeah, it does have a benefit, which is that um, Yuji, like, gets down on one knee, he's like, Mikio, no, listen, um, even though you didn't get the rock... That's totally okay, because what you brought me was more valuable. You taught me a lesson. You taught me the lesson that I need to believe. Oh, yeah, like, and, and this is, you know, earlier Chief was saying this stuff, like, you know, he needs to believe in the power of his allies. Um, and now, Yuji fully knows, like, he has now sort of fully internalized the childlike belief of Mikio, and he's going to use that to put his faith into his allies and learn how to cut that helmet in half because all of these things are connected uh, because energies, right? Yeah, man, because of energies. Energies are great. Okay, so we cut back to the, the waterfall. Um, and actually, the, the camera first goes to the waterfall before it pulls back and shows them like back in their like uh, geese with their swords about to cut the helmets. Um, and for a second, when they were just showing the waterfall, I really did think that they were just going to be showing the O-Rangers, like, wading around in this river trying to find the piece of space metal. They do not. It is totally unimportant. Uh, but they do need to cut these helmets. So they go back, and they all stand in their line, and they pull out their swords, and they raise them up, and then they pause, and everything goes quiet. And like a dragonfly lands on the tip of Goro's sword. And they feel the power of the earth and each other or whatever. You know, there's not a lot of explanations to what is happening here. But they do all cut these helmets in half. And in this moment, Chief knows, like, yes, now, now, my my children, you are ready to summon the, the great power of the Twin Blades. Uh, because the the weapon on this is not one sword. It's like a double saber. It's very cool. We will talk about it in one second. Okay, so all the blocker robos launch, right? 
Um, and they do not waste any time in becoming O Blocker. Let's okay, Dave. I know you love. I know you love the big robots. Man, listen, I'm here for the big robots, Matt. You know that's why I'm here. I've said it since day one. Okay, so do you want to describe how this thing works and how it comes together? Yeah, man. So, like we said before, the the shapes of, like the the helmet shapes of the different rangers, are like mirrored in the shape of these giant robots. Like their torsos are the shapes that appear on the masks' helmets. If that makes sense, right? So this robot is sort of a combination of all of those shapes, and it like although the individual robots look very blocky. Like, they're called, like, the, the blocker robots. They are very, like, they're sort of designed to be blocky. Um, the O-blocker, like, super combined robot is not very blocky at all, actually. Like, it's kind of sleek. Like, yeah, man, the, uh, like, the, the triangle becomes, like, the sort of, like, the waist area. And the, uh, I was actually sort of surprised that the sort of, like, the two yellow bars do not become either the arms or the legs. Yeah, they become, like, pauldrons, sort of, on the shoulders. Um, this thing looks very cool. It's got, like, a star in the chest. Uh, uh, it's, listen, just just look it up. Or if you remember from Zeo, uh, what would have been called in Zeo, Matt? Oh, it's the, uh, I think, the Super Zeo Megazord. It's the second one that they get. It's, you, you guys probably actually might already know what this thing looks like if you have watched that show. Um... Which I actually did this week. After watching this, I watched a couple episodes of Zio, uh, and boy, like watch, like trying to like get into the brains of the writers of Zio to figure out how they sort of got from point A, like you know, the point A of O Ranger to the point B of Power Ranger Zero, or Zio is very wild to me. Yeah, man, I can I can imagine that knowing what we know about this series, watching that one is just. It's kind of baffling. Yeah, you know, that is the perfect word for it, Dave. It is kind of baffling. Not bad, but definitely weird when you see, like, footage from O-Ranger, and then it cuts to a bit with Bulk and Skull, where Bulk and Skull are hanging out with Goldar and Rito Revolto, who are from the Sentai, from com two completely different shows. So there's three different shows all represented in one show. It's... I cannot get into this because if I do, I will just be talking about only that. And there are two other very good podcasts you can listen to for that. So, Dave, where on earth were we? Uh, okay, so Matt, we were in this fight. The O blocker has just been created. Oh, right. Yes. So when the O blocker is created, there's something in the robot that says all our hearts are as one. And Goro says to the chief, hey, chief. Why did this robot just tell me that all of our hearts are one? Yeah, um, and, and apparently what is happening here is that it's not just that the that O Blocker can tell that all of their hearts are together, but that also means that they are together with the heart of O Blocker itself, which is extremely good. Uh, yeah, man, I I love I love a lot of this episode. Um. <laughs> So now that their hearts are together, they're in this fight. Bacchus Wrath goes to hit them with the Dark Sword, but I guess that this like formation of O Blocker is only sort of loosely attached because they just sort of like uncombine, let the sword pass through the gaps in between where the robots connect, and then they just slide back into place and get into the fight. It's a it's a cool move, and I wonder if it's the sort of thing that they're gonna do like one time when the thing is new and then just forget that it does that. Oh yeah, because I feel like that happens all the time, right? Like you get a new robot, you see it's 12 cool tricks, and then after you have shown all of those 12 tricks, it proceeds to only ever summon the sword and kill the monster in one hit. Yeah, I it's it's kind of a disappointment, but it is cool that when we get the new robot, we do get to see all the fun stuff. So, they're fighting, and you know, like the fight goes for a while. They they summon the like these two sabers. They're sort of like these yellow energy things that formulate into like kind like two kind of curved blades. Um, Bacchus Red comes at him with the dark sword. They like now that they know how to cut metal with swords, they just cut his dark sword in half. So it's. 
Like, he is apparently not as invincible as he thought he was. Yeah, man, that sword lasted for one half of one fight. I mean, I guess, I guess to be fair, they did have to go do special training to be able to do this. But it's kind of a letdown that Bacchus Wrath gets into, like, his first and probably only big fight. And he just goes, like, his weapon is destroyed immediately. <laughs> so, yeah, man. And, and like you said, it's, it's kind of over immediately. Because they break the sword... And then they summon their new finishing move, which is the twin block and crash. And like they, they take both swords and sort of like put them together, like just like, you know, mush them together. So kind of so that they look like a Shatterstar sword where like both blades are in parallel. Uh, you know how all cool swords should be. Um, I mean, that sounds like a very bad sword to me, but hey, I mean, it's not good, but it is cool. Okay, that is fair. It is cool. Um, and it just becomes this giant, like, super length lightsaber. And they just cut Bacchus Wrath in half. So that's it for Bacchus Wrath, I guess. Because this episode is called, as we said at the beginning, The Emperor's Final Challenge. Um, and that's just it. Bacchus Wrath gets cut down the middle and he explodes. And his wife and child are watching it happen. Bulldont says, oh, I like I, I must swear my revenge on the O-Rangers. Uh, Empress Hysteria uh, applauds him for being such a good and dutiful son. Um, and that's, I guess, man, I guess that's probably it for Bacchus? I, it, it's very strange to me. I, I don't want to put him on the Creature Royale yet. Because I want to give him time to stay dead, I guess. I don't want to have to revisit him. So yeah, I guess that makes sense because he's not going to be on the uh, he's not going to be on the regular creature feature anyway. He's going to be in the um, like in the other column with the generals and so forth. So we can put him off to the end of the season. But man, if this is the end of Bacchus Wrath, that is crazy stuff. Man, I know. Like, I, this is kind of the second year in a row that we've had something like this, where we get to sort of like a half, two-thirds point of the series, and then the guy we've been dealing with is just gone. But now what? Are we just going to have, like, Bulldogs to fight? Oh, man, I hope not. I, I hate that horrible little gremlin. I, he's, he's, he's a loathsome creature, uh, but I kind of don't know what else to we would see. I bet that if I had watched more of Zeo as a child, I would not be surprised by any of this stuff and would have a lot of answers. But uh, that is not the case. I have not done that, and I don't believe that you have either. Oh man, dude, I have, I have maybe watched one episode of Zeo, uh, and it was not um, particularly memorable. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, it, I mean, it's good if you watch a bunch of it, but I, I think just watching one out of context episode of Zeo is probably not the best experience for that. Yeah, yeah, it's probably fair. Um, but yeah, so the, the thing they fought this week was Bacchus Wrath, so I guess they don't really have, we don't have a monster of the week for him to have fought, so I guess that's just it this week? Maybe? Man, who knows? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, let's, let's wrap this up. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's gonna do it for another episode of Your Eyes O Ranger. Before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all... You can email the show at supersentaibrothers at gmail.com. If you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we're talking about online, we are at Super Sentai Bros. Uh, if you like the show, I, I, I really hope that you do. This episode especially. Um, if you like this show, please remember that shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. Rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you find the show. That is what's going to help new people find it. Uh, Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio. If you want to find any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows, you can do that at RetrogradeOrbitRadio.com. Once again, we are the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth.